Hello students, I'm Jan and this is yet another Poem College video, specifically a video on shell coding. This is the introduction of the shell coding module of Poem College. Hopefully you have come to this module knowing computer architecture, some uh, assembly fundamentals, and what a binary file is and so forth. If you're missing some of this knowledge, we have a series of fundamental videos that I highly recommend you go watch before trying this module. All right, let's get started. As a review from those computer fundamentals, uh, specifically computer architecture fundamental video, uh, the modern computer architecture that is most popular, let's say among the systems that you'll interact with consciously on a daily basis is the von Neumann architecture named after one of these three Johns that brought us this architecture. Von Neumann architecture, as opposed to some other architectures such as the Harvard architecture, um, you know, kind of philosophical design, uh, treats data and code interchangeably. Um, the von Neumann architecture is basically this Matryoshka uh, doll of, of, of caching layers and uh, data flows between these caching layers from, you know, the open internet to your disk, to your memory, to your uh, CPU cache to CPU registers and so forth and this data can be uh, this data can be code or data uh, interchangeably and this can cause problems so let's dive into one specific uh, example of a security problem that this can cause here's a program that a not very skilled programmer myself wrote and in the course of writing this program made several bugs we're going to talk about one specific bug in this lecture. In future modules, we'll talk about other bugs. But this specific bug allows an attacker to achieve shellcode execution. That is, to inject binary code that will be executed under the um, exact permissions and so forth of this program, right? in the context of this program. So how does this happen? Well, let's take a look at this program. Um, first thing that you see is two different functions that say by one function that says hello. Right? The hello function actually takes a pointer to the by function and invokes it. Function pointers are a feature of C and certain other programming languages that allow you uh, at runtime to target uh, the calling of these pointers to different places in memory. Right, so this hello function receives a memory address, and when it's time to say goodbye, it invokes that memory address. This is not a rare pattern; it's used uh, actually quite frequently in, in complex code bases. Right, passing around these function pointers, and if you look at the main functionality of this program, um, you see that it first reads a name, and here's actually where there's another vulnerability that's we'll we'll deal with that later. Um, it this program reads a name uh, and then chooses randomly to invoke the hello function with one of the two goodbye functions, right? Either by one or by two. And if it uses by two, it all looks great. There's a name that it uh, passes, that's the name you input, and then there is um, the function pointer. But when it uses the first case, when it uses by one, it reverses the order. The programmer, myself, made a mistake. And in this tiny program, this mistake is laughable. <clears throat> but in a large code base, again, this is a very easy mistake to ma make, just a mix up of um, argument order. Um, so by one gets passed uh, in as the name. So the name is now binary code. So the data is, is, or the code is being treated as data. And <clears throat> what's worse is my name, which is data, is now being treated as code. So what are the implications of this? Right? The implication of this is when the by function gets invoked, the by function pointer, when the program execution jumps to the address that was passed in to the hello function, program execution gets transferred into the stack where my name uh, that I inputted lives. This is very bad. Of course, modern computers have mitigations against this because this is such a common issue. Um, 
maybe not through this specific vulnerability pattern, but in general. Uh, if you're going to compile this program with these mitigations disabled, this is what dash Z exec stack is. Uh, I'll talk in a later video about how the stack is no longer executable so that this cannot happen. Um, although this does not make shellcode useless as I'll talk about in that video as well. But um, uh, for the purposes of this introduction, we're going to disable that mitigation with this option. So let's take a look at how this works. All right. Here is our program, hello.c, um, exactly as on the slides. If we uh, compile it, um, we're gonna just disable uh, all of the warnings. There's one warning that we cannot disable and that is that you should never, ever, ever, ever use gets in anything. Uh, the gets function, it uh, receives input until a new line and doesn't care how much input. So it'll uh, overflow any sort of uh, variables that, that you try to contain the input in. All right, but we're using it because it's easy. Um, so we run the hello function. It asks for my name, just hangs. I hit Jan and luckily we hit the farewell case. If you recall, uh, the farewell case is by two and by two is properly passed in. By one is the one that's passed in in the wrong location. Let's keep trying. Jan, hit, hit it again, Let's try again, boom, program crashes. So here you can see that it printed some garbage. Um, most likely what happened is it printed hello, and then there was a carriage return, uh, which puts the, the print back to the beginning of the line, and then it printed more stuff, right? Um, and then um, there was uh, an illegal instruction and the program crashed. All right, let's uh, take a look a little bit deeper in uh, GDB. So here we are in a debugger. Let's run, starting program, put in yawn. Ah, got lucky, got lucky, boom. Okay, here's our illegal instruction. Immediately you can see a couple of things. If you look at the um, process map and memory, so you can see that hello is loaded at this address here, this 5454000 and, and, and you know, a couple of pages after that. If this isn't familiar to you, please go back and watch the uh, Linux binary or Linux process loading video in the computer found the fundamentals of Pwn College. Um, it'll be also linked in from this module on Pwn College, so you can uh, easily find that video. Uh, what we see here is that we are nowhere near that program, uh, the location of that program. In fact, we are in the stack where we're crashing. And if you see what um, is at the instruction pointer where we're crashing, we see that it is the last two letters of my name. So the first letter of my name must have been a valid instruction, which it is. Let's take a look at what that is. The first letter of my name is translates to pop RCX in x86-64 assembly. Pretty cool stuff. Okay, um, so we have injected shellcode. We have injected binary code directly into the application in a way that the application will uh, execute it. And, and this uh, was super simple. It, it was caused by a programmer mixing up the order of two arguments. Imagine that. All right, um, uh, this isn't just a, a theoretical thing. This has been uh, seen in the wild for over uh, 20 years. In fact, over 30 years. Uh, in 1988, um, Robert Teppen Morris, a, um, I think he, he had either just graduated from Harvard or was a Harvard student at the time, created the first documented version, or the first documented uh, example of a computer worm using the first documented example of um, uh, shell code and of actually a buffer overflow and a lot of you know firsts right uh, these ideas and concepts have been floating around in the uh, in the wild for a while but uh, the Morse worm was the first to demonstrate them in uh, practice so 
the Morse worm was actually surprisingly complicated for the first uh, worm of its kind. But one of the vectors that it exploited was a buffer overflow, a stack buffer overflow in finger D. Actually, something very similar, very, very similar to the vulnerability, uh, the other vulnerability, the gets call in uh, our example program. But we'll talk about that in a future module. Um, it used this to inject shellcode, to run commands, to gain a foothold in the machine from which it, uh, and the victim machine, from which it scanned adjacent hosts and infected them to propagate the worm. And this thing shut down the internet. Uh, in order to bring the internet back up, people disconnected essentially the whole internet and then shut their individual networks down to fix the worm, bring them back up, and then reconnected to the, the reconnected the internet. Right? Imagine something shutting down the internet today. It'd be chaos, you know. Especially uh, nowadays, as I'm recording this video during the COVID-19 pandemic, where you rely on the internet for basically everything. Uh, interestingly, you can try uh, to mess with the the Morse worm yourself at this link down here, um, or at least uh, try to exploit the vulnerability that the Morse worm um, uh, took advantage of. This might be more relevant a couple of modules away, so um, you might not have the background knowledge needed yet, but keep that in mind. I'll also give it a shout out when I think it is time for you to give that exploitation a try. All right, so why do we call it shellcode? Well, we call it shellcode because the typical uh, kind of traditional goal of this exploit is to gain a, get a shell on the machine, is to run something like bin sh. Thus, we call it shellcode. So this is an example that uh, calls this system call, exec ve bin sh uh, with two null arguments. If the word system call is unfamiliar to you, please go back and watch the assembly language fundamentals video um, or the Linux process execution fundamentals video, ideally both. All right, so um, this sets up an exec ve system call. Uh, 59 is the uh, syscall number of exec ve. Um, so it puts that into RAX, that's where the syscall number goes. Then it loads into the uh, first argument, a slot RDI, the address of the string bin sh, that's what will be executed. And we have this down here. Um, this uh, format um, RIP plus bin sh, so this is of course the instruction pointer, plus the offset to bin sh, that's what this stands for. LEA stands for load effective address. And so the address of bin sh as it is relative from RIP gets loaded into RDI. This is very cool because uh, this means that this shellcode just forms a block that you can put anywhere in memory and, and this will find um, the uh, 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 bin sh path. Um, then we null out argument two and three the way exec v works, this is good. This just runs it with no arguments and, and no environment uh, variables. If, again, if those uh, terms are unfamiliar with you, please go back and watch the uh, Linux process execution fundamentals video. Um, and then it triggers the syscall. So this is shellcode in AMD64, uh, also known as x86-64 assembly that gains a shell. Let's take a look at how it works. All right, let's get out of our GDB session from earlier. Um, so, uh, actually, I'll, I'll, I'll bear with me. I'll take a look at how it works in a second when I talk about how to actually compile the shellcode. So we have to talk about that first. All right, first thing I'll point out, there's this dot string thing, right? So again, uh, von Neumann architectures, data and code all mixed up. You can put data in your shell code. In this case, we put this string here. Um, you can also put arbitrary bytes. Um, there's actually a lot of other uh, directives for putting in floating point numbers, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, you likely, in the course of writing shell code, only really interact with uh, adding um, data with dot byte and adding data with that string. So that string adds a string and puts a null byte after it. Um, if the concept of null terminated strings is not familiar to you, please um, 
go back and 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 uh, review your C knowledge. That should be a um, concept that you learned when you learned C. Um, when you put dot byte, it just dumps the bytes directly. Um, this is one way of embedding data in your shell code, right? Um, and that's the way that we used in our example here. We put the, this string right here. Um, other ways, uh, I'll, I'll go through one here. So you can push it onto the stack. So here, what we do is we move this data to RBX and we push RBX onto the stack. Um, and then we move uh, the address where the stack pointer currently points to, which is where our data was just written to RDI. So in this case, we, we um, did the same thing. Um, sorry, back in the, the first case, this loaded the address of bin sh into RDI, and then this pushes RDI uh, pushes bin sh onto the stack. So in, on the stack you have slash bin slash sh, and you can see that this is at the ASCII values of the bytes uh, of the characters backwards because it, this is a little Indian system. Um, and we push it to the stack, and then we move uh, the stack. Uh, we, we we take the stack pointer which is pointing at that string we just pushed and we move that to RDI. So in both of these routes, uh, RDI is pointing to the stack. Um, there is, sorry, RDI is pointing to bin sh. Um, there is a shell code that is not designed to uh, get a shell. That's not always your goal. In fact, in this class, it will work as your goal, but um, it's much easier to just, uh, um, sorry, it's much easier to just read the flag directly, uh, although the shellcode is actually a little more complicated. So this shellcode is a shellcode that opens the flag, slash flag file and uses a system call called send file to um, send the file over. Um, this shellcode uses the concepts of uh, Linux file descriptors, which is how Linux tracks files. So here is the open syscall. We uh, use the, the um, pushing method to push the slash flag file name, right? So we, we move slash flag um, into RBX, we push RBX, and then later on, we move that RSP into RDI. That's the first argument to open. And then, um, open is system call number two. Um, so we move two into um, uh, RAX and then into RSI. This uh, last argument, we put a null, which is actually the value of um, uh, signifying to open the file read only. And we do a syscall. So this open slash flag. Um, and then we set up the send file arguments. And so send file, and you can pull up the man page and I will show you that you can pull up the man page. Here, send file, transfer data between two file descriptors, and the arguments are the output file descriptor, the input file descriptor, the offset um, into the file in bytes, we just want to read from the beginning, and the number of bytes to read, and we'll just read a bunch, right? And the way that it, we set it up is, we set up the uh, first argument one, so that's standard output in Linux, so that you know, it just prints it out to the screen. Um, the second argument is the return from the first syscall, the file descriptor of the open file. This will likely be uh, three, um, but doesn't have to be. There could be some random stuff. Um, it's a, a random number depending on how many files have previously been opened. Um, and we read from the beginning and we read a thousand. Um, and we set all that up the uh, syscall number for send file is 40 and then we call syscall right and so now we do uh, open send file and then here we have a um, uh, system call uh, exit so that the shell code exits uh, cleanly we didn't do that in our previous uh, exec v shell code because exec v as um, discussed in the Linux loading fundamentals video actually replaces the whole process with a new process. So it'll replace your, your process that you're exploiting with bin sh completely. This shellcode does not. So in order to avoid crashes, which make it very hard to understand that your shellcode crashed or did the program crash after your shellcode executed, uh, we cleanly exit the program. Cool. All right.
Now, finally, we have uh, moved on to uh, building our shell code. So we write our shell code as assembly code. Um, there's some boilerplate that we need um, to set up a global uh, symbol that is the start of the um, um, shell code that when we assemble it into a binary file, uh, we can actually just execute it like a normal file. This really helps debugging. And we say, okay, here's where the start um, label is. And then we say, by the way, we're using Intel syntax. Uh, by default, the tools we'll be using use AT&T syntax. It's very annoying. It is the wrong syntax, but um, we luckily we can use an option to use Intel syntax. Phew. And here we are setting up our our bin sh shellcode that we looked earlier. Uh, that, that we looked at earlier. Then we assemble it. We'll assemble it into a an L file into a program that we can run. We assemble it without uh, the standard libraries because we don't need them. We don't use them. We directly call uh, using system calls into the kernel. And we create a static file also because this makes it easier uh, in certain situations. It doesn't invoke the dynamic loader at all. Nothing. It's just here is your shell code running directly in the self. That's pretty exciting. Um, this is, by the way, this produces a program, not shell code. It, just, it produces an actual program with an elf header, et cetera, et cetera. Um, uh, as you should know, and if you don't, please go back and watch the fundamentals lecture on what is a binary file. Um, your L file contains a dot text section, um, with the shell code, uh, with the code of your program. In this case, the whole code of your program is the shell code. Um, and you can use object copy to copy that shellcode out. And now that resulting shellcode-raw file are the bytes of your shellcode that you would inject in your exploit. That's pretty exciting. So let's uh, let's take a look at how this would work. Uh, all right, here is our shellcode, shellcode.s. It's the same shellcode that's on the slides, just calls um, execv bin sh. If we, um, compile it, dash no std lib. We don't need the standard libraries, dash static, just to simplify some things. Shellcode.s, dash show shellcode elf. It compiles. And when we run shellcode elf, boom. It runs bin sh and we have a shell. Of course, we had a shell before, but no one is uh, complaining. Uh, let's disassemble it real quick. Uh, just to see that it has our shell code in Intel format, of course. And here it is, nice and simple. In the start of the program, here we have our move RIX 59, that is OX3B in hexadecimal. Load the address of RIP plus OX10, that's our bin SH. Um, we move, uh, zero out RSI and RDX, that is the argv and the environment. Then we trigger the syscall. Cool. So let's copy out this will dump the text segment into our um, uh, text section, excuse me, into our shellcode raw file. All right. And now we can hex dump shellcode raw and you can see it's the same bytes 48 C7 C0 and so on all the way to the end of bin sh. Um, I should point out one thing, uh, when we were disassembling our shellcode, of course, not knowing any better, Objudum tried to disassemble bin sh as well. But you know, you'll have to deal with that on your own. All right, uh, I mean, it's just uh, how Objudum happens to work. But here's our shellcode. This is the shellcode that we can now uh, transfer directly into our uh, vulnerable program. Um, so we can cat out this shellcode into our hello, as a reminder, hello, put in my name, and that gets executed directly as shellcode. Um, this is going off script a little bit. I didn't actually uh, think to run this 
And what I'm doing right here is first printing out the, the shell code and then just dropping in to an interactive like a cat that reads my input and writes the output. Um, otherwise, I'll cat out the shell code, run hello, it'll run bin sh, and then bin sh will terminate immediately because there's no further input because the shell code, code is done. All right, here we go. Oops, cat shell code raw. And we have a shell. I had to hit enter because gets will keep reading until a new line appears and I didn't put a new line in. Let's actually uh, put a new line in. So this will echo a new line and this will append it to the shellcode raw file. Now let's hex dump shellcode raw. There's now a new line here. That's very cool. Then we run it again. So see it did fare well, so it didn't hit the right case. There, now it hit the right case. And now we are in, we have a shell on my machine through an exploit by injecting shell code as my user. Pretty cool, huh? You can hit exit and now that program's dead. All right, so that is how um, shell code works. We've now built shell code, what's next? Um, we already saw how to run it. Um, actually, I, I jumped ahead a little bit, um, but just to reiterate, the nice thing about compiling it in this, uh, assembling your shellcode in this method that I've taught you um, is that you can run it directly and also debug it and so forth as we'll get to very shortly. Um, interesting thing here, there are a lot of different methods to write shellcode and, and, and specifically to assemble shellcode. There are other assemblers. Instead of using tooling built into GCC, there are other assemblers such as NASM and, and various others, you can use those. Uh, but in my experience, it makes things a little bit harder for um, reasons that you won't benefit from for this course. I'd recommend using the method I taught because that method is very easy to debug, very applicable, and actually is super applicable to other architectures than AMD64 as well, whereas, uh, other assemblers tend to be specific for one architecture. All right, um, if you're not happy with the shellcode runner that uh, gets compiled as your ELF file, which is just basically an ELF wrapped around your shellcode, you can create a C program that'll load your shellcode, map it as executable into memory and execute it. Um, this might be uh, useful when you need to simulate really tricky conditions, open a different files, stuff like that. Um, and you don't wanna write that all in assembly as a preamble to your shellcode. Um, and this is generally how you would do it, right? You would uh, create a uh, pointer, um, function pointer called page, memory map a bunch of code that's executable, read your shellcode into it and execute it. All right, and then you inject that in the same way that we injected our shellcode into that uh, tester program. All right, how do you debug shellcode? Let's say shellcode is going wrong. Something something is, is, is driving you insane and things aren't working. Well, one way from a high level is to use strace, right? Strace, um, as you should know from the fundamental uh, series, is a system called tracer. It'll simply run your program um, uh, with debugging and print out all of your um, all of the syscalls that your program does. So let's take a look. Um, actually, first let's break our shellcode. Uh, how about instead of bin sh, let's actually have it go bin sh plus one. I have no idea if this uh, will work, but let's compile it. Okay, it works. All right, um, or rather it it is assembled. So shell code uh, that elf, we run it, illegal instruction. Well, that's bad news. What went wrong with our shell code? If we S trace it, and this is an awesome uh, result of the shell code being you know, inside an elf file and easily runnable. If we S trace it, we see right away what's wrong. It executed bin slash sh instead of slash bin slash sh and got a no such file or directory as a result. 
Cool. Then we modify it, fix it, reassemble it, rerun it, and then we see that it is actually now executing VinSH. Um, and if you scroll up, it's right here. Very cool. All right. So that is S trace. That's how you debug your shell code um, on a high level. Um, and, and, and this catches a shocking amount of, of errors that you make shell coding. If you need something more, you can debug shell code with GDB. It's just a Linux program, the way that we assemble it, right? So let's um, take a quick look and then this slide can be a good reference for you. Um, if we, again, do something silly uh, to our shellcode. If we, I don't know, what, what, what might we do? We might accidentally have uh, some dereference here that's not good. Right, so we okay. We're loading into RDX memory that our size is pointing to, but our size is pointing to uh, the, the to to zero, so it's gonna crash. All right, but this will assemble, and when we run it, it segfaults. Of course, run in GDB, run it. Oops, shellcode dash l, run it. Okay, it segfaulted immediately. We can see what where did it segfault? It segfaulted at this move into our DX, the pointer to RSI. We can see what is RSI right now, or what is it pointing to? And we see that it is zero, and so can't be dereferenced. Now we know what's wrong. Um, let's take a quick look at some other um, commands that, that some other useful things we can do in GDB. Um, keep in mind breakpoints, um, because there are no uh, labels, or actually there, there can be labels, if you put in the label, so you can actually set, for example, in GDB, although this makes no sense, break uh, bin sh, and it sets it, and we can actually, if, if, if that was ever run, um, but actually here we can uh, add more labels, right? These labels mean nothing really. You say, okay, uh, label one, label two, and then when we assemble it, GDB it, we can do break label one, break label two, run, and we hit the break one, label one. This is awesome functionality to be able to, to do for your uh, shellcode. And it doesn't actually modify your shellcode at all to have these labels. You can still extract your shellcode. The labels are all in other parts of the ELF. Um, it just makes debugging much, much easier. Um, other things that we can do, if you don't want to use those labels, just keep in mind before the address where you want to break, you have to put a star. And one of the reasons that we compiled things statically, I'll talk about another reason later, if you recall, this creates a static elf. If again, we talk about static and dynamic elves in the um, binary files uh, fundamentals. Um, but uh, one of the reasons is when you have a static elf, it always maps or it gets compiled in a way by default that it maps everything into this fixed 400 instead of random memory. So it's a little easier to debug. Um, all right. If you um, want to break at a memory location, just remember, put a star in front of it. Um, a couple of things that work kind of weirdly um, in source code, you're used to hitting when you're in GDB uh, debugging a C program that you built with um, dash G for like the GDB um, uh, uh, for, for debug symbols. Um, you're probably used to hitting S to step one line of code. This isn't source code, this is assembly code. SI will step one instruction. Don't use S, use SI. SI will follow call instructions. Sometimes that's what you want, sometimes you want everything um, uh, that you want that call to execute and then you want to, to uh, get control again, that is N I next instruction. So next instruction will step over a call. Of course, the call will execute and then you'll get um, your uh, uh, the GDB shell back. Uh, SI will step into the call. Both are useful, but it's important to know the difference. Uh, there are different ways that you can uh, look at data with these modifiers. Uh, this means examine the data that our RSP points to and treat it as one 
gigantic word, and this is eight bytes in hexadecimal format. Um, other options for the hexadecimal format includes string. You saw me use that at the beginning when we were looking at hello, the program. Um, I for integer, uh, no, sorry, I for instruction, and I think D for, for, for uh, decimal uh, integer, and X for hex. Um, and then you can, of course, use P to just print out their value without uh, the value of this expression or this register without dereferencing them. And we have G, eight bytes, D, four bytes, H, two bytes, and uh, B, one byte. And then you can print multiple. So all of these invocations will print eight bytes of whatever you're um, looking at. Um, run and continue and all of this stuff works as normal. It is just a Linux program, it just happens to only contain your shell code. And in fact, a useful thing is that reverse execution, and you can go follow this link and set up reverse execution, also works as normal. So you can check all of that out. All right, final thing we'll talk about um, in terms of debugging your shell code is hard coding in breakpoints. It turns out that when you create a breakpoint in GDB, I mean, there are several different styles of breakpoints. When you create a, a normal default, software breakpoint in GDB, it'll actually replace the instruction um, where you have a breakpoint with an int3 instruction. Int3 instruction is a single instruction that decodes into CC. You can actually, or that encodes, sorry, assembles into the byte CC. Um, you can look at it right here, uh, where I will now try it out, uh, shellcode dot s so let's take away this buggy thing and instead take away these labels instead we'll put an int3 here so this will inject a hard-coded uh, um, breakpoint into our shellcode right before syscall gets run let's uh, assemble it great if we run it now it's gonna crash because we don't have a uh, debugger attached and we're not um, capturing this sig trap uh, if you run it with GDB, boom, we get into a breakpoint at exactly where we expect it to, right before that syscall. Very cool. So this is a uh, useful, I mean, of course, in GDB, normally you can just say, okay, break at the label or, or break at the address. But when you are actually debugging the vulnerable program that you're exploiting, and you want to break at the syscall, this is much easier. It's much harder because you don't always know where your shellcode will end up and so forth to put in, um, um, uh, to, to, to set the debugger, the, the breakpoints in GDB. So if you put a breakpoint at the beginning of your uh, shellcode, assemble, and then let's look at you know our, our old version of this. this. Wow, we're really, what the heck? This is like flipping like five in a row. All right, and so we, we um, of course, we no longer, oh, we didn't opt copy it out. Okay, so now we have the version with the debugger. What's going on? Are we really hitting it? Oh, I forgot to hit enter. I Sorry about this. Of course, we've now overrode that new line that we had put in there for the um, the gets. Okay, now boom. Okay, there we go. We hit hello, and we hit that breakpoint trap. Now, if you were running uh, hello in GDB, it would have dropped us into a debugger just like you saw earlier, and we can now debug the shellcode. And you don't have to put it in the beginning, this int3, you can put it anywhere you want. Cool. All right, what is uh, next? How do you write shellcode for other architectures, right? So, so far we've been talking about x86-64 slash AMD-64. Well, it turns out with this method of assembling shellcode using um, GCC, essentially, and its tool, specifically the uh, GAS assembler, um, turns out that it's almost the same. You can install a cross compiler on your system and you can use that cross compiler to compile shellcode for MIPS, assemble shellcode for MIPS, which is 
super exciting. And you can also uh, run that shellcode with an emulator and test it out before deploying it on some real system. Um, if you use QEMU as your emulator, QEMU has a dash S trace option. If you S trace QEMU itself, there's a lot of syscalls that QEMU is calling. Um, but if you do QEMU dash S trace, QEMU itself will print out all the system calls that the um, uh, shellcode or whatever program you're emulating is calling. Um, and if you uh, pass it the dash G option, it'll open up a port for remote debugging uh, for your shellcode, which is pretty awesome too. So this uh, set of tooling is really nice um, for shellcode. All right, um, let's say you want to uh, practice, right? Uh, which you do, of course, that's what Pwn College is all about. Practice makes perfect. Head over to Pwn College, um, choose a level and uh, of the shellcoding homework analyze that code and understand the constraints that your shellcode um, must satisfy and the changes that will be made to your shellcode and write shellcode to bypass them. Um, depending on when in the year you're watching this video, the challenges might be down for about half a week as we um, uh, prepare them for the next, uh, for, for this current class, if there is one. In that case, just hold tight, I'll announce when the challenges are available, and then you can go solve them. Good luck.